I don't always shitpost. But when I do, I prefer video game shitposting. Well, another generation has come and gone for Nintendo. Now the Switch is out, and while plenty of people are focused on that, I'd say it's time to look back at the past generation. And let me tell you, the Wii U was a console for the... I'm sorry, I've never been good with alternative facts. Yeah, even with glasses slathered with rose-colored paint, even I can't deny that from a sales standpoint, the Wii U was a total flop. And while we could argue for hours about why that was the case, at least some good came out of it, right? Hey, I was able to play enough good games to make a list about it. Granted, I'm mainly focusing on games that were either exclusive to Wii U or started out as exclusives. That's pretty much the only rule here. So I'd better get started with reading this eulogy. It's game time! I still stand by a previous statement I made that Kirby's Epic Yarn is one of the most charming games I've ever played. So a follow-up would be right up my alley, right? So how do you follow up something like that without making it look like a carbon copy? Well, making it a Yoshi game doesn't hurt. Yoshi's Woolly World is probably one of the best Yoshi games since the original Yoshi's Island. One reason for that is because it treats the fundamentals of the original with plenty of love and care, keeping the gameplay solid with minimal gimmicks. Yoshi slips up enemies and makes yarn balls, which may as well be eggs, to throw at enemies, hit switches, and whatnot. Poochie is there, and arguably a lot more helpful this time, and there's tons of collectibles to find. On the other side of the coin, the presentation is just as charming as Epic Yarn, with plenty of attention to detail. The textures still have that lovely craft shop feel. In fact, the yarn models look arguably better than the more two-dimensional figures in Epic Yarn. The music also has that certain charm to it, akin to a children's cartoon. It's very lighthearted and fun. And with two levels of challenge, both newcomers and veterans will find something to like here. And the icing on the cake? The only cost of getting hit is a few hearts, instead of having to put up with... <laughs> Uh, someone give that baby its bottle already! Xenoblade Chronicles is easily in my top favorite games of all time, so when I learned that Monolith Soft was making a follow-up on the Wii U, I was pumped. So, how does Xenoblade Chronicles X stack up to the original? In some ways better, in other ways, not so much. The plot doesn't stack up nearly as well as the original story did, trading the twists and turns of the conflict between Bionis and Mechanis for a decidedly less interesting plot involving the remnants of humanity trying to eke out a living on a new planet after some alien jerkwads blew up the Earth. And I didn't find the characters nearly as compelling. On the other hand, X focused a lot more on world-building, and they honestly did a good job with that. The world of Mira is absolutely massive, and just like the original Xenoblade, if you can see it, there's a way you can get to it. The gameplay is definitely a step up as well. Not only do you create your own character, but you can also build a fighting style similar to an MMO with various types of blades and firearms. The combat is refined with this in mind, and you really need to work together with your teammates in order to take down some of the tougher life forms. The music is also great, ranging from the various overworld themes to battle themes such as the earworm that is Black Tar, as well as Uncontrollable, otherwise known as... Don't lose your way! 2.0 also, there's one thing about X that I can't go without mentioning. The mechs. Not only are they fun as hell, but they make exploration a lot easier, and combat with the Skells is so satisfying. Yeah, there are issues with X, but the good definitely outweighs the bad here. Except Tatsu ain't no hero pawn. Donkey Kong Country Returns was one of my favorite games on the Wii because it harkened to my old-school sensibilities. Call it me wearing the nostalgia shades, I'm an ape with a tie again, who gives a shit? And while a direct sequel was something I wasn't expecting, more of the same can be a good thing if done right, and Tropical Freeze is real good. This time, the DK crew has more to worry about than their bananas. They've been thrown out of their homes by a bunch of good-for-nothing Vikings, though that may sound redundant coming from a Packer fan. Tropical Freeze basically builds on the solid, tough-as-nails foundation built by Returns, continuing the tradition of challenging platforming, tons of collectibles, excellent visuals, and kick-ass music, done by none other than David Wise this time. And, of course, his sound work is evident here, including remixes of some of the series' more memorable tunes. The levels are also really well done, and they have plenty of variety. 
African savannas, sawmills, a goddamn freezer. This game's covered plenty of ground. And when I said the DK crew, I meant the whole crew. Diddy and his jetpack are back because, let's face it, it just wouldn't be right without Diddy. Dixie is also returning from DKC2 and is even more busted than ever. That ponytail has gotten me places I'd never be able to go otherwise. And what's this? It looks like Cranky just had to stop telling people to get good and actually do something. And by the looks of things, he must have been old chums with Uncle Scrooge, if you know what I mean. If I had to say one thing against the game, it would be that some bosses can be pretty annoying. But the amount of fun and challenge more than make up for that. Now when can we fight the Kremlings again? Pokémon. Tekken. The two don't seem so much peanut butter and chocolate as squid ink and spaghetti. But Nintendo and Namco found a way to make it work. For years, I've dreamed of a game where you can directly control a Pokémon in battle, so as you can imagine... Pokémon Tournament? Yeah, it's good. The combat in this game is fun, alternating between arena combat similar to the Ultimate Ninja Storm games with close-range Tekken-style gameplay. This results in quite the flashy display of moves, not to mention that the stages look great as well. The Ferrum region has quite a bit of personality to it, with a fun combination of cities and nature. But come on, we all know that the Magikarp Festival is objectively the best stage, right? Right? But what I probably love the most about this game is how they managed to add variety to an admittedly small roster. They could have taken the easy way out and stacked the roster with bipedal fighting types, but they weren't content with just 50% of the ass. No, they went for the entire ass. Yeah, you had the obvious choices such as Charizard, Lucario, and Pikachu, two of them in fact, but they managed to add more unusual choices as well. I mean, how well would you have expected Suicune and Chandler to function in a fighting game? And those burst attacks are pure anime, drawing from Dragon Ball Z, JoJo's, DBZ again, Naruto, DBZ yet again, and even the magical girl genre for good measure. But one thing I'm salty about is that there were four more Pokémon added to the arcade version with not so much as a mention of Wii U DLC. With the Switch out now, I think we need a definitive version. Because I want my Darkrai, pliss! Nintendo's been capturing the imaginations of kids since even before the 80s, but the crowd that grew up with the NES and even the Super NES? Well, they've grown up. And I'm willing to wager that their tastes have changed with the times as well. So as much as I love Mario, Zelda, and Kirby, I'm also glad that games like Bayonetta 2 exist. After the first game failed to light the sales charts on fire, there were doubts that we'd ever see a sequel. Thank God that Nintendo stepped in, eh? This game fixed several of the issues that the first game had. The combat was even more fluid and satisfying than before. Combos linked together nicely, and the Umbran Climax is such a power rush. The reactions of enemies to being attacked look a lot better, with several more animations. And it's all as stylish and fun as before. The pacing is a lot better as well, and QTEs are a lot more forgiving here. I also like the art direction compared to the first game. Bayonetta looks as alluring as ever. In fact, I actually like her better with the short hair. I also enjoyed the story, which did a lot for the characters as well as the series' lore. The personal stakes that took Bayonetta into the depths of hell, and revealed some pretty interesting facts behind the events of the first game, kept me invested from start to finish. But the best part of Bayonetta 2 is that it's even more ridiculous than its predecessor. I mean, one boss fight has you fighting the masked Lumen while Madame Butterfly and Temperancia are duking it out in the background, culminating in a head-to-head -head slugfest between the Angel and the Demon. Just... what else can you say except HOLY SHIT! With the amazing Breath of the Wild becoming a joint release for both the Wii U and Switch, that leaves the Wii U as the only Nintendo console without a mainline Zelda exclusive. So that just leaves spin-offs to satisfy our Helian cravings. And what better way to let Link and his posse just cut down wave upon wave of mindless mooks? Fans of Dynasty Warriors and its spin-offs can agree that it's one hell of a power trip, and Hyrule Warriors proves to be another example. The feeling you get when you take the battlefield and dominate the enemy army fits surprisingly well with the Zelda universe. The combat is fast and action-packed, the super moves are a sight to behold, and the level of Zelda franchise fanservice is through the roof. Not to mention there's a metric crap ton of content in the game. You've got your story mode that's basically just an excuse to tie all these Zelda timelines and characters together, you've got the free mode which just lets you go to town as whoever you damn well please, and you've got the adventure mode, which by the way is not only freaking huge, but also puts your skills to the test in ways that you wouldn't expect. And that's before the DLC scenarios and characters that were slapped on the eShop over the game's lifespan. Each character plays in their own unique way, so you're bound to find a character that suits you, and the adventure mode maps encourage you to try them all out. But the sheer spectacle of the game just trumps everything else. It's such a blast, and it really gives me excitement for when Fire Emblem Warriors comes out later. 
I suppose I'll get my chance another day. Well, it's another day, isn't it? Okay, this one was a given. Smash has become one of Nintendo's biggest sellers, with probably one of gaming's most toxic fan bases, but I digress. The fourth entry in Nintendo's mascot-laden All-Star Slugfest has plenty to offer. Yes, there are issues with a lot of them in single player. The event matches are probably at their worst, I didn't much care for the format of Classic Mode, and Smash Tour can eat the entire ass. But at its core, the game is still the Smash we know and love. Not as overly fast and glitch-laden as Melee, but not as slow and trip-heavy as Brawl was. There were also some new wrinkles added in, such as the amiibo training, custom moves that could be unlocked, and the addition of Mii Fighters. But probably the biggest thing about this iteration of Smash was just how much there was. The number of music tracks alone was staggering, but that was nothing compared to the lineup of fighters. The roster was the biggest yet, and some characters came from unexpected sources. Newcomers came from all kinds of places. Characters from recent games such as Palutena, Shulk, Lucina, and Robin, classic characters like Little Mac and the Duck Hunt duo, third-party characters including Mega Man and Pac-Man, and even a fair amount of characters as DLC. Mewtwo, Lucas, and Roy were welcome returning veterans, but there were also some characters that really came out of left field. I mean, who expected Ryu to enter the fray? And how many minds were blown when that trailer revealing Cloud dropped at the end of that direct? And who could forget Bayonetta winning the fighter ballot? I can only imagine what kind of characters we'll see when Smash comes to the Switch. Because let's face it, it's gonna happen. New IPs are always a risk, especially for a company like Nintendo that lives and dies by its signature franchises. On the one hand, you could end up with a piece that ends up in the bargain bin of history, and on the other hand, you could get Splatoon. Judging from how heavily Nintendo promoted this game since its announcement at E3 2014, it's safe to say that they had a lot of faith in this game, and rightfully so. Nintendo basically looked at the gray-brown military shooter, thought of it, and decided, hey, you know what we could do to make this appeal to a wider audience? Splash a big fucking drum of paint over it! The idea of a 4v4 paint gun battle between a bunch of squid kids seems silly at first glance, and, well, it is, but it's also loads of fun. The idea of painting as much territory as possible, instead of straight-up kills, means that the strategy is largely different than a lot of other shooters, and teamwork is more essential for success. Especially considering the mobility that your squid form offers in your Team Colors Inc., as well as providing both cover and a place to reload. There's also a lot of Nintendo signature charm to be found here, from the various merchants who sell you the gear you need for battle, to the unforgettable Squid Sisters, and even the game's main villain. Oh yeah, that's right, there's a single-player campaign here, but it's basically training for the main event. Also, Nintendo put a lot of effort into keeping this game's lifespan going, with regular updates introducing new weapons and features. And hey, the Switch is getting a sequel this year, complete with dual-wielding! Can we get some new Splatfests while we're at it? Please? Oh hey, it's our favorite band of masked heroes again! To be honest, it's been a while since I talked about the Wonderful 101 last, and I apologize for that because this is a game that sadly got swept under the rug. I say sadly because in spite of its admittedly steep learning curve and a few problematic levels, this game was an absolute blast for me. With so many superhero games of varying quality, it was refreshing to see a game like this with such personality. It was like playing a superhero cartoon with the way the game presented itself. The characters are colorful both in personality and appearance from the straight-as-an-arrow leader Wonder Red, to the cocky Wonder Blue, and all the rest of the team, and even the villains. They're all entertaining in their own way, and we even get some opportunities for character development throughout the story. Speaking of the story, I really enjoyed the plot as well, as it took itself seriously when it needed to, and not seriously at all when the situation called for it. As for the gameplay, once you have the system down pat with the various Unite morphs, you wouldn't believe the crazy crap you can do with all of them. Assembling your team and creating more and bigger Unite Morphs to take on bigger and more powerful enemies is just really satisfying. And the Morphs actually play a solid role in puzzle solving as well. Some of these puzzles are really clever, not gonna lie. And the boss battles are just plain crazy. When the first boss is a giant mechanical three-headed dragon, you know you're in for quite a spectacle. This is a game I had a ton of fun with, and even 100%ed, it, and it shows that developers like Platinum are at their best when they can just do their own thing. This is the sort of game I'd love to see a sequel to. Action fans, unite up! I love 2D Mario as much as the next guy, but it can only go so far. All you need is to look at the base game of New Super Mario Bros. You mad to see that. So what's a company that wants to advance the series to do? 
Throw it over to the fans and learn to your horror that a good number of them are sadistic pricks. Real talk though, Super Mario Maker was the kind of thing the Wii U was made for. Kind of akin to ROM hacking without requiring the complex knowledge thereof, this title is a fully functional and amazingly robust level editing game that lets you create the most vibrant, most creative, or most ball-twistingly torturous Mario levels your brain can come up with. The interface is simple to get the hang of, and the more you create, the more you can do. Levels that play music on note blocks, twisted boss rush levels, levels that feature special characters, including many from Amiibos, evil Kaizo levels, even 2D shooter stages? This game lets you make all that and more. The levels you can create can easily surpass anything that's been seen in the 2D Mario games made by Nintendo themselves. You can even switch between four different graphic styles depending on just what kind of Mario game you grew up with, or simply whatever you freaking want. And of course, what kind of modern level editor wouldn't let you share your creations online? The 3DS version! <laughs> but let's not get off track. You can share levels directly with friends via level codes and watching each other, but if you want to see most of what the community has to offer, the game offers up the 100 Mario Challenge. Can you get through the courses on 100 lives? Probably if you're on easy, almost definitely not if you're going for super expert difficulty. Nintendo also had some stages of their own up their sleeves, of course, including a few crossover events which are actually rather clever. But the level builders of the community really made this game shine. In fact, I'd probably recommend this game to aspiring game designers as a way to practice level design. Just keep any trollish instincts in check. I'm the Quarter Guy, and while it remains to be seen if the Switch will be a long-term success for Nintendo, it does bear mentioning that the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller is natively PC compatible. So, if the Switch does end up being Nintendo's last console, they could easily make inroads into the PC gaming market. Hey, stranger things have happened. <laughs>